Welcome to Homeland, 10 Stories, One Israel. Israel has brought together millions of Jews from across the diaspora in the world's most chaotic family reunion. This podcast is about what that really looks like. Though the series is fictional, each person is based on real stories shared with us by real people. When we last left our cast of characters, they were stuck in a shared cab on the side of Highway 1, Israel's main highway connecting Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. The rain pours outside while they wait inside, not so patiently for a tow truck to get them home. To pass the time, chatty American Emily has been making friends, maybe a tad aggressively, with her fellow commuters. Today, you'll meet Galina Abramovich Azulai, one of more than one million Soviet Jews who emigrated to Israel from the former Soviet Union between 1988 and 1999. You'll hear about life in post-Soviet Russia, the good, the bad, and the bizarre. You'll hear about the difficulty of immigration, the triumphs of being part of a Jewish state, and the mingled pride and shame in having a contested identity. This is truly ridiculous. How long does it take to get a tow truck? <laughs> Welcome to Israel. It takes months to get a package from Jerusalem to Ashdod. You're joking. Barely. That sounds inconvenient. That's life in this country. But it's got to be better than Russia, though. No? Of course. But this is... What's the expression? A low bar? <laughs> so, how old were you when you left? I was seven when we decided to leave, and when we actually left, I was eight. So, old enough to have memories of life before Israel. Yes, but I've done my best to forget. Really? She is just being cynical. I'm Russian. We're cynical people. Probably the healthiest coping mechanism there is, honestly. And the most Jewish. Yes, I'd say this is accurate. Though I didn't learn this until I was a little bit older. Where did you grow up? A suburb outside Moscow called Himki. The way I remember it, it was <laughs> not very nice. No matter how old she got, Galina was certain that she would always remember the summer of 1992. She couldn't have said what the weather was like, or what she did most days, or what she and Mama and Papa ate for dinner, or what she wore. But two events stood out with an ultra HD clarity that not even the best TV could match. A sort of vibrant aliveness. The first was the grand opening of the new grocery store in town. A sign, everyone said, of the hopeful post-Soviet future. The second was much less pleasant. I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt so quickly, and I also want to hear the second thing, but like, what was so exciting about a new grocery store? It is hard to explain to someone who did not live through the collapse of the Soviet Union. But all of a sudden, everything was different in a way I did not fully understand until later. All the adults around me seemed more excited. There was a sort of cautious hopefulness, because now everything was going to be different, which didn't last very long, of course. Why not? Because this was Russia. I don't get it. You'll see what I mean. But at the time, in my mind, the store was a symbol of this new and exciting change. And I don't think it was just in my mind. I think it was in many people's thoughts as well. Got it. It was a Spanish store. Galina makes air quotes around the word Spanish as though to indicate that the store's relationship to Spain was tenuous at best. I remember the shock I felt when I went there for the first time. Everything was so clean, so perfectly arranged. <laughs> Everything in the new store was beautiful. Straight lines, sharp 90 degree angles, a designated place for every product. And there were so many products. Delicate pink curls of cured meats, five different types of olives, citrus fruits in tempting colors, little foil-wrapped chocolates with almonds or orange or figs, oils and vinegars, and one huge, particularly foul-smelling wheel of cheese. Mama and Galena walked through the store in silence, Mama's tread heavy and slow. She said that the baby made her very tired, but for once, Galena wasn't annoyed at their pace. She thought she could stand in each aisle for hours just looking. They bumped into Tetya Masha from down the hall, her basket filled with jam. 
You don't make jam at home anymore, Masha? Mama asked, smiling. Not quince jam, Tetya Masha explained. Sounds good. Maybe we'll come over for a little taste soon. <laughs> Unless I eat it all first, Tetya Masha said. She turned to Galina. Hello, Devochka. Hi, Tetya Masha, Galina mumbled, trying her best to hide behind Mama. Tetya Masha had only recently stopped pinching Galina's cheeks, but Galina wasn't taking any chances. Those pinches hurt. Are you excited to be a big sister? Tetya asked. Galina did not believe that a question this dumb warranted a response, but Mama would be very upset if she was rude. So she said, sure, hoping that would settle the matter and they could all move on to more pleasant topics, like going to the dentist or being punished. I'll be thinking about you, Tetya Masha said to Mama, especially at your age. She clicked her tongue disapprovingly. I'm 31, Mama protested. Exactly, said Tetya Masha, and walked to the cash register before Mama could answer. Okay, rude of your neighbor. <laughs> you think this is rude? Uh, yeah? Galena shakes her head and laughs. <laughs> Americans. Emily frowns until Elun takes pity on her and explains. Here in Israel, and also in Russia, it sounds like, we have different standards for what is rude. Trust me, I have Israeli roommates. I'm beginning to get that. In the end, Mama and Galina bought very little at the grocery store. A few tendrils of cured meat with exotic names, a bottle of vinegar, two little chocolates, orange flavored for Mama, plain for Galina. With a self-satisfied flourish, the cashier placed their purchase into a plastic bag. Stop, Mama said. I don't want to pay for the bag. I have one here. From somewhere in her purse, she produced the old string bag she used for groceries. The cashier gave a funny little bow. They're free. Mama looked at him sharply. What do you mean, free? We don't charge for them, he said. You can use as many as you need. He gestured to the plastic bags hanging up by the cash register. Today, it looks like you only need one. Next time, if you buy more, you can have as many bags as you need to help you carry everything home. Mama frowned. You're certain? I am certain, the cashier said. All right. She took the plastic bag from him and gave it to Galena. Let's go home. I don't get it. What's the big deal about plastic bags? We had never seen such a thing, especially not for free. You didn't know what plastic bags were? No, it wasn't that. We knew what things were. But to have a first-hand experience with these products... This was the magic of that grocery store. Wow, this is honestly wild. Oh, don't get excited. There's a very Russian coda to this story, but it didn't come until later. First, I had to get through the worst day of my life until then. Oh my god, like a pogrom? <laughs> this was 1992, not 1902. No, not a pogrom. The birth of my baby brother. The baby was surprisingly pink and squishy. It was unnerving. I don't like him, Galena announced after a thorough inspection. His ears stick out and his head is shaped funny. Give it time, Galia, Mama smiled. I promise he's going to become so cute. He'll crawl around after you saying your name. You're going to be his best friend. No, I won't. You might surprise yourself, Mama insisted. I will not. Mama gave Papa one of those annoying adult looks that said, We are having a private conversation without words, even though it's rude to tell secrets in front of other people. And Galena, understanding she was going to get nowhere with these two, stomped off to read and sulk. Wait, you could read already? I was seven. I was about to enter second grade. Of course I could read. Fair enough. Did you like school? Oh, I did like school. I liked math. I'm a big stereotype, basically. What do you mean? You know, Russians working in engineering or science. It's a stereotype. You don't have this stereotype in America? I guess our stereotype for Russians is like chess, classical music, vodka. Sorry, was that offensive? <laughs> you think I haven't heard all this before, and much worse? In the case of my family, the classical music stereotype is true. My mother is a violinist. That's so cool. None of us play chess. What about the vodka? 
Uh, this I will not confirm or deny. Fair enough. What do you do, by the way? Like, for work? I'm a data analyst. So you were always a nerd, is what you were saying. What is a nerd? Chnunit. Wow, that's an amazing word. Anyway, you were telling me about school and about how you weren't a nerd. When you're seven, school is still exciting. I was a good student and interested in everything. The only part that wasn't so great was the priest. He would come to the schools now and again and say prayers. We all had to call him father, which was very weird for me because I had a father and also because this guy wore a long black robe that made him look a little bit frightening. So your teachers, like, forced you to say Christian prayers? Oh, no, not really. No one forced anyone. I simply did not participate. But sometimes afterwards, the other kids would be, I don't know, a little weird. Weird how? It was just obvious that I was different. Me and a few others in the class. There were three of us, Lev, Dima, and me. Most of the time we were treated completely normal. But on the days that the priest would come, it felt different. Were kids mean? Like anti-Semitic? Oh, it was not that. More like they made us feel different. I felt like I had a big neon sign on top of my head that said Jew. So you knew you were Jewish? Yes, of course. And everyone else knew that about me, too. Did you, like, celebrate holidays and stuff? No, not really. Well, when I was perhaps five or six, someone brought my father matzah for Passover. This was the only Jewish thing I remember until we started talking about moving to Israel. This is so sad for me to hear. Did you know what the matzah symbolized? No. My father said, we're supposed to eat this today. And I asked why, and he said, because we are Jews. So I ate it, and it was disgusting, and I asked my mother to put jam on it for me. And that was it. That was Passover. So your understanding of being Jewish was like matzah and feeling weird around priests. (laughs) And Israel. It was also Israel. Or rather, all the arguments about going to Israel. I'm sorry if this is a really stupid question, but I thought the Soviet Union was, like, totally anti-religious. Why was a priest coming to your school? Yes, I was wondering the same thing. That was true in the Soviet era, but this was 1992, after the Soviet era. Now it was okay for people to show interest in their roots. Religion stopped being a taboo. The Russian Orthodox Church started becoming more involved in the culture. So there were priests that would come to schools now and then. So if other people were, like, rediscovering their religion, did that mean Jewish people were too, or were Jews still, like, really persecuted? You are thinking about the 60s and 70s, and part of the 80s. This was when Zionism was a dirty word in Russia, especially after the Six-Day War. Zionism, not Judaism? The bad word was Zionism, but the bad word only applied to Jewish people. So I don't know that this is not anti-Semitism. Of course it's anti-Semitism. Yemach Shemam. What does that mean? He is cursing the Soviets. Oh, okay. So Judaism and Zionism were suppressed in the Soviet Union, but your parents still moved to Israel? There was immigration to Israel even back in the 70s when the propaganda was really, really bad. Things started to change around 1985. By the late 80s, everyone was digging around for a connection to some great-grandfather with a Jewish last name. People wanted to leave. It was not a pleasant place to live for anyone. So, did your whole family go? Everyone. We were some of the last to leave. Most of the family left in the late 80s. About half of them ended up in America, and half came here. Why didn't your parents leave right away? So, this is just my theory. But I think that by the time the Soviet Union collapsed, they felt a sense of hope. I think there was this idea that if they just hang on a little bit more, everything in Russia would be okay. Things would be good. But it didn't work out that way? No. Because of anti-Semitism? No, not really. Because of Russia itself. What do you mean? It's a little bit hard to explain, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, it was like we had a whole new country, and very quickly, it became like the Wild West. 
Mama was angry. She pushed Alex Stroller into the elevator and recoiled instantly, herding Galena into the corner. As usual, there was a puddle of urine in the corner, but today it was joined by a pile of feces. It smells, Mama, Galena said, covering her nose with her scarf. I know, her mother said, using the corner of her coat to press the button for the lobby. It did not light up. The buttons had been burned and defaced to the point where it was unclear whether they still worked. You needed to give them a very hard poke, and even then, they wouldn't always cooperate. But today, Mama must have pushed hard enough because the elevator began its slow lurch down. Hold on to the stroller, Galia, Mama said, pushing it out of the elevator, and don't talk to any of the men in the lobby. They were greeted by the usual chorus of whoops and innuendo as soon as they rounded the corner into the vestibule. This was the domain of the apartment building's teenage boys, who spent their days smoking cigarettes, harassing every woman who went through the doors, and drinking something that smelled like the liquid that Mama used to clean the floors. Sometimes they were replaced by the building's older men, their faces collapsed but kind. Galena preferred the old men to the young ones. They felt less dangerous, more sad. Today, though, the boys had taken over. Where are you going? They shouted at Mama, who wheeled the stroller without breaking stride, her mouth set. Galena had to hurry to keep up with her. Hey, kid, tell your mama to smile once in a while, one of them said to Galena. Hooligans, Mama said furiously as she hurried outside. Those boys. She muttered something vile under her breath, then looked at her daughter apologetically. I'm sorry, Galia. Those boys are, she shook her head, disgusting. She was so distracted that she wheeled the stroller directly into a deep crack in the sidewalk, jostling Alex from his sleep. He wailed as Mama lifted the stroller and muttered under her breath again. I can't continue like this, Misha, Mama raged at Papa later that night as she chopped vegetables for dinner. Garbage everywhere. The elevator looks like a toilet. You know the Spanish store? They started charging for their bags, and everyone is now only allowed two. People were stealing them. It's disgusting. This country is disgusting. She punctuated each word with another whack of the knife on the cutting board. You know, if I fell and slipped on the street, people would just walk around me, like they walk around the garbage. I'm not going to continue like this, Misha. Whack. 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 Galia shouldn't see things like this. She shouldn't have to hear things like these boys outside were saying. She shouldn't have to go into the elevator and see her neighbors have used it as a toilet. This isn't human, Misha. We're living like animals. You know how I feel about this, Papa said. I've said it many times. If it were up to me, I would have left yesterday. Yes, but Israel, Misha? You want Galia and Alex to grow up in a bomb shelter? Would you rather Galia and Alex grow up around piles of garbage? But why Israel, Misha? It's dangerous. Why not somewhere safer? America, Germany. You know they're not handing out visas to America like they used to, Papa said. And I will be damned if I go to Germany. Absolutely not. Israel is the best solution. My brother is there, my parents, your sister. The children can grow up near their cousins. Mama gave a final whack of her knife and sighed. I'll think about it. Wait, so after surviving the Soviet years, the final straw for your parents was garbage and poop in the elevator? You don't understand what it's like to live in a country that is so disgusting, with such bad infrastructure. Graffiti everywhere, garbage everywhere. Nothing nice, nothing peaceful. Why was it like that? <sighs> after the fall of communism, there was this sense of every individual is for themselves. There was no concept of making things pleasant for your neighbors or taking care of anyone outside yourself. Everything was me, 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 and the rest of the world can go screw itself. But pooping in the elevator? Like, what's the purpose of that? Like, I get that if you're a selfish monster, you might, like, litter or something, but why go out of your way to poop in the elevator? I don't know how to explain it. You know, for a moment, we were all so hopeful... So excited, there was a sense of possibility. But very quickly, that possibility was gone. Nothing changed in our lives, not really. It was just the same old thing. 
Except that now you knew there were some other people getting very rich, but you were not one of them. If you missed the train, you were full of resentment. So you did things like poop in an elevator. Miss the train? Oh, like miss the boat. Like if you missed your opportunity. Uh, yes. So the solution to this for so many of the men, and it was always men for some reason, and teenage boys, was to drink all day and for the angrier ones to destroy what they could. That's so sad. There were many bad things about immigrating here, but the public spaces, the trees, the gardens, <sighs> sunshine. This was the best change for me. It was like, <sighs> my mother said it was like going from a black and white movie to one in color. Wow, that's quite a description. Yes. By the fall of 1992, she agreed to go. This was after my father was attacked in the street. What? Oh, not because he was a Jew or anything like this. It was because of the time. The easiest way to get something was to steal it. So on his way to work one day, or maybe his way back, I, I don't remember, a few kids hit him and took his wallet. Maybe they had weapons, I don't remember. Maybe my parents didn't tell me because they didn't want me to be afraid. But he came home with his nose all bloody and <laughs> boom. It seems like the next day we were packing a suitcase. This isn't true. Probably it was a few months, but in my mind it all blends together. Wow. So this was the start of 1993. Yes, February. I remember because I had my eighth birthday party in Israel. But we didn't know many people except our family. So the only other kids there were my cousins. And they thought it was funny to teach me rude Hebrew expressions and have me repeat them to adults. It's cool that you lived close to family. I mean, once they stopped bullying you. We moved to a neighborhood that was mostly Russian. Well, not Russian. There were many Ukrainians and Moldovans and Latvians. But it was mostly people from the former Soviet Union. So did your parents, like, not have to learn Hebrew? They did. We all did Ulpan the Hebrew language program, except my brother, who just went straight into Gan, school for babies. By the time he was old enough to speak, he was speaking to my parents mostly in Hebrew. Aw, that's so cute. I love when little kids speak foreign languages. Did you speak Russian at home? My parents spoke to us in Russian. I would answer in Russian, but very often my brother would answer in Hebrew. And he knows how to read in Russian, but his reading is very, very bad. Do you speak Russian with your kids? Uh, I try, mostly so they can communicate better with my parents. But it's, uh, what is the expression, a lost cause? They understand it much better than they speak. How long did it take you to learn Hebrew? Mm, not a long time. Kids are fast learners. It took my parents much more time to get used to a new alphabet, a new bunch of sounds, new rules. And it did not help that they were always surrounded by other Russian speakers. So they had not as many opportunities to practice. Even my teachers in school, some of them spoke Russian. So when they went to talk to my teachers, they sometimes did not have to speak in Hebrew. Now, their Hebrew is okay. Very heavy accents. This is a familiar story. I was embarrassed by the accents of my parents at first. It wasn't Israeli. For me, it was not as much like this. It was more like, as soon as an Israeli heard my parents speaking, or they heard my name, which is very Russian, they assumed they knew everything about us. They had a stereotype in mind. <laughs> that was annoying. What do you mean? When I started becoming friends with Israeli kids, not just Russian speakers who had moved here, but Sabras, they had many rude assumptions. Like what? Like that my family weren't really Jews. That was the most annoying one. Why would they say that? Because you didn't know as much about Judaism? In part, it was that. But in part, also, there were many people who came to Israel because they had a Jewish grandparent or great-grandparent. They brought families and children who were not considered Jewish by the Orthodox. You know the Orthodox think that you have to have a Jewish mother in order to be considered Jewish. So there were many assumptions that not only weren't we Jewish, but we were Christians. Was that hurtful? It was confusing. The first time someone said this to me, it was at school. I was maybe eight and a half or nine. 
I still had a little bit of a Russian accent, though it went away eventually. She said something like, What are you doing here? You aren't really even Jewish. This was such a strange thing to hear. I had been the Jewish one in Russia, and now in Israel I was the Russian one. It wasn't just me. There were many Russians, but I think many people resented that the Russian Aliyah was changing the culture of Israel too much. There was a sense that we were not really Israelis. We were Russians. This was the reaction to us too, to Sfaradim and Mizrahim. Like we were turning Israel into a different place. When did you start feeling Israeli? Hmm. You know, it didn't take so long. I walked my brother to school. I took the bus by myself. After school, we were allowed to come home alone because my parents were working. We could also go to the neighbors if we wanted. There was no sense of worry that the children weren't safe. I think my parents appreciated that the most. What about, like, your first Seder? Or, like, holidays? Did those make you feel Israeli? Mm, It's a good question. Uh, I don't think so. We were definitely not religious, so it was more... uh, And now we are going to all get together for a big dinner. My uncle would lead the Seder, but it was a very secular Seder. We didn't get rid of the bread in the house. We did the Seder, we said thank you for the freedom, and then we moved on to our normal lives. So you're still not religious, I take it. You know, this is funny. I never expected this. But I married someone who was more traditional. And now I have a much more traditional life than I ever thought I would. Ooh, yeah. Where'd you meet your husband? (laughs) He was the cousin of a friend of mine. We worked together in the same bar after the army. Wait, so many questions. You worked in a bar? (laughs) Of course. I wanted to go abroad after the army and I needed to make some money. We were both bartenders. Romantic. Yes, true romance. He was in charge of training me, so he acted like my boss at first. I had to, uh, 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 what's the expression, to put him in his place. Hmm? And you've been doing that ever since? Exactly. Wait, okay, I want to know about the bar, but I also want to know about the army. What'd you do? I mean, if you're allowed to talk about it. (laughs) It's not a secret. I worked in a unit that prepares people for emergencies. I worked mostly with older people. For this kind of role, you need to know at least two languages besides Hebrew. I knew Russian, of course, and my English was very good, even in high school. I am feeling very uneducated right now. The man sitting next to Galina, who had spent the past hour slumped in his seat with his head against the window, sits up and smiles at Emily, Galina, and Elun. Dude, same. The trio stare at him, surprised to see a sign of life. Sorry, I... I've been listening to you guys for a little while, just, you know, casually eavesdropping. I'm sorry, did we wake you up? No, all good. My neck was starting to hurt anyway. I'm Matan, by the way. Uh, Also, an ignorant American who only really speaks one language. uh, One and a half if you count my pathetic Hebrew. Thank God. I was starting to feel extremely unimpressive. No, you're in good company. Sorry to interrupt. I think you were about to get into something kind of juicy? Oh, yeah. Let's be real, I care a lot more about how Galena met her husband than what she did in the army. No offense, Galena. None taken. I love asking people how they met their spouses. Actually, Matan, my fellow American, are you married? Four years. He holds up a hand, displaying a gold wedding ring. Amazing. You're next. You know, (laughs) I had a feeling you'd say that. I'm a creature of habit. Anyway, Galena, please continue. (laughs) We worked in a bar that doesn't exist anymore. I think now it is some kind of office space. He was supposed to be training me, but he was very full of himself. Galena hated Iran Azulai on sight. He swaggered around with a self-satisfied smile, conducting Galena's training as though she were an absolute moron. He liked to randomly quiz her on things like the composition of gin and tonics, the location of the whiskeys, literally right behind her, or the proper way to cut a lemon. She was about ready to cut him after the third time he tried to demonstrate. And he was clearly fresh out of the army, because every other anecdote started with, When I was an officer... Oh, were you an officer? she asked, after the third or eighth or fifteenth time he brought it up, as they prepared for the Thursday night rush. I had no idea. What's the proper procedure for dealing with a former officer? Do I salute you? Or do you prefer us humble non-officers to bow in your presence? 
At ease, Abramovich, he said. I'll cut you a break. This is an informal setting. How generous, she said dryly. You know, my soldiers trembled in fear whenever I walked by, he joked. At least, she hoped he was joking. Well, I guess if you can't make them love you, making them fear you is the next best thing. He raised an eyebrow. What about you? Do you love me or fear me? She rolled her eyes. Is entirely apathetic to you an option? Apathetic? To this face? He asked, pointing at himself. I don't think so. She pretended to look him up and down. Nope, entirely apathetic. Maybe mixed with a slight tinge of pity. He laughed. Pity I can work with, Abramovich. Now, hand me that lemon. You're cutting it completely wrong. Wait, this is so cute. Like, such a vibe. How long did it take you guys to, like, become a couple? (laughs) Months. He was cute, but very annoying at first. What changed? Mm. Eventually, he became more cute than annoying. Wow, true love. Was your first date at the bar where you worked? (laughs) Of course not. Would you want to go on a date in your office? Well, I don't have an office because I am delightfully fun employed right now, but I get what you're saying. (laughs) Anyway, in the end, we quit at the same time and went abroad together. Wait, that's so cute. Where did you go? Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, the usual places. Oh yeah, the super long post-army trip, right? My roommates told me about that. Exactly. We were there for five months, and we managed not to kill each other. (sighs) I knew I was going to marry him as soon as we came back home, both in one piece. How romantic. She turns to Elun and Matan. Did you guys do a post-army trip? No. This was not as popular when I was young. Yeah, I did, but... It was short, like like two weeks. I was a chayal boded, a, a soldier who doesn't have any family in Israel, so I spent a really long time back home with my parents in L.A. That sounds like it was hard. I have a feeling I'm about to tell you all about it. I like that you've already accepted your fate. Anyway, back to Galina. So, you took this trip together. What happened when you came back? Did you get married right away? We waited a few years. We got married when I was 25 and he was 27. Two years later, we had Amir. So... That is it. That's my story. Very classic. Thanks for sharing. Are your parents still alive? Oh, yes. They're still here. Retired now. They spend a ton of time with their grandchildren. <laughs> my brother Alex is getting married in a few months, so my parents are already planning how much time they're going to spend with his children. <laughs> Crazy people. Do they get along with your in-laws? Enough. It's a strange relationship. They come from a totally different culture. His parents are Algerians, very traditional, very loud. They like to laugh, make jokes. My parents' sense of humor is much more subtle, very dark. It was a strange combination at first, and my parents are not religious at all. Your in-laws are Orthodox? Orthodox, maybe, kind of. They won't drive on Shabbat, but they might go to the beach. That kind of thing. Got it. So, you know, when he brought me home, it was a little awkward. They believe a lot of stereotypes about Russians. Like what? Oh, the usual stupid things. They said things to him like, Is she even Jewish? She's going to cook you a mayonnaise salad. Russians have a different mentality than us. How will we communicate with her parents? Etc. Etc. Stupid stereotypes like that. Mayonnaise salad? Israelis are very rude about Russian food. But, you know, everyone is rude when they're not used to something. When we first came here, I thought the food was disgusting. Wait, are you serious? Why? I thought falafel was a meatball. I had to spit it out. It was... You're insane. Oh, I like it now. You have to get used to it. My son Amir's favorite food is schug. The green spicy stuff? Yes. He puts it on everything. I make him sandwiches with it. He likes everything so spicy it burns. Respect. (laughs) Yes, it's just funny. To think about how different his childhood is from mine. That's the point, isn't it? To give them something better than what you had. Sure, that's the point. We'll see if we succeed. There's that famous Russian optimism. (laughs) Listen, leaving Russia was never ever in question. We were not going to continue to live like we were living. It was miserable, disgusting. The only question was where we would go. Are you happy it was here and not like Germany or the U.S.? (sighs) How can I answer this? My whole life is here. My husband, my kids, my job, my friends. 
I think I could have adapted and built a good life almost anywhere, but it's good here. Even now, in this... She gestures at the cab, the highway, the rain. But like, do you feel proud? Of what? Being Jewish, being Israeli. Uh, I don't know what this means, really. I am happy Israel exists. I am happy it's mostly safe. I am happy my kids feel like they belong. I am happy we don't live in garbage and that no one does poop in our elevator. I am happy that people care about each other. I am happy we can vote. Does that answer the question? What about your children? Aren't you happy they understand their heritage? They know that Passover is more than just dry matzah? Sure. I don't even think about it anymore. You're right. But maybe I would have a different answer if I had come from a more comfortable situation, like America. I didn't have this connection to Israel like Alon did. We ran away from Russia. But we were not running to Israel, you know? It's not like you, Matan. You could have stayed in America. I don't know. Philly's kind of gross, too. Is that where you're from? Nah, I'm from L.A., but my wife's a Philly girl. We like to talk trash. Good to know romance isn't dead. So, how did a guy from L.A. and a girl from Philly end up in Israel? You mean, how did a black guy from L.A. end up in Israel? I mean, I wouldn't have put it that way, but sure, I'd love to hear your story. If you're okay with telling it. I don't know if you know this, but I really like hearing other people's stories. In unison, Galina, Matan, and Elun say, We We know. know. So, my story's a lot more like Alon's than Galina's. Uh, I came to Israel because I wanted to, not because I felt like I had to. Thank you for listening to Episode 2 of Homeland, 10 Stories, 1 Israel. Homeland is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked-related, and subscribe to our other podcasts. Follow Unpacked at all the social media places like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. And write to us at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com. This episode was written by Adi Elbaz and produced by Rifki Stern. Our team for this episode includes Adi Elbaz as Emily, Rebecca Davis as Galina, Hussein Mohammed as Elun, and Gideon Kimmel as Matan. Audio Magic was produced by Rob Perra. I'm your narrator, Ellie Schiff. Special thanks to research help provided by Misha Kornyankov, Dr. Pavel Kazanov, Josh Trackman, and the excellent film, Welcome and Our Condolences. This show is made possible by support from the Coombe Family Foundation, the Crane Mailing Foundation, the Adam and Gila Milstein Family Foundation, and the Skolnick Family Charitable Trust. Stay tuned for Episode 3, Matan Story. How does a black guy from L.A. end up in Israel?